everyone. Welcome to the Marty Smith's America Podcast, Volume 17. We've got an awesome show for you guys this week with West Virginia Mountaineers quarterback Will Greer. Will's taken a unique road to the 2018 Heisman Trophy race. He's a preseason candidate. In fact, WVU recently launched the Will Greer for Heisman campaign. As a high school player, Will was Mr. Football USA. He threw for nearly 15,000 yards, a North Carolina state record 195 touchdown passes, nearly 3,000 rushing yards, and 31 rushing touchdowns. Ultimately chose to play college ball at the University of Florida, but midway through a tremendous freshman season, he was suspended for using performance-enhancing drugs. I hate even bringing it up. It is old news. But it's part of his journey, and so we discuss that during this conversation. He was suspended for a full year. He transferred to West Virginia to play for Dana Holgerson, and last season he lit it up. He threw for 34 touchdowns. Who knows what his numbers would have been had he not broken a finger on his throwing hand in Week 12. Now he's healthy again and arguably has the nation's top receiving core heading into the 2018 season. That's a Heisman recipe in the wide-open Big 12, if I've ever heard one. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation with him. Will grew up two miles from my front door in Charlotte. He's a legend in Crown Town. And as he'll tell you in the interview, he's the most anonymous of the Greer kids. His brothers have millions of social media followers, and they live in L.A. and the whole thing. Meanwhile, Will's on those West Virginia country roads up in Morgantown, married with a little girl. So that's a little bit of Will's backstory. Again, I th- enjoyed this conversation so much. Uh, as someone whose career I've followed since he was a freshman in high school, to now be on that short list of preseason Heisman Trophy candidates. So now, here you have it, my conversation with West Virginia quarterback Will Greer. All right, Will, so first we got to discuss this Greer family situation. For people that are listening that don't know, I'm just going to lay this equation out for you real quick. All right, here's Will Greer, 23 years old, husband, father, Heisman Trophy candidate, among the most decorated high school football players in the history of North Carolina. Hell, the country, I guess. (laughs) Great hair, recognizable guy, right? Then you got these brothers who are on Dancing with the Stars, got 7 trillion social media followers. Your old man is a high school coaching legend around here, where I live in suburban Charlotte. So... It is a circus. All right, it's the Greer Circus. Will, what is the craziest moment you can recall experiencing as a family in public? Oh, wow. I'd have to go back because it, it's, it's for sure a circus. Um, and we live in all parts of the United States now, it feels like. But uh, <laughs> I'd have to say, man, we there's one point where – I, you know, I was in, I was playing AAU baseball and they were both playing AAU like lacrosse and basketball and everything. I mean, we, we all played sports and, you know, my dad coached, uh, one of my brother's baseball teams and he coached like a bat because, you know, Chad just loves to coach. So, I mean, there was, there was weekends where <laughs> we would be driving all over North Carolina, changing in the car to play a couple different sports and, I mean, it, it, I mean, it was almost embarrassing the way we would pull up just with clothes and, and equipment everywhere. Um, but those are some of the best memories we have, man. It was, it was, a, it's a, it was a fun circus, um, you know. And obviously, here we are, and, and and all doing our own thing. But uh, I got all kind of memories, man. What about now? What's it? What, what What's it like for all you guys being public together with everybody being so well known? Oh, it's. I mean. You know, it's obviously Nash and Hayes are, you know, way more well known than than we are. That well, at least with the younger crowd. Um, obviously, the college football fan base doesn't really understand what Nash and Hayes do. <laughs> I don't. They, they know I'm, I'm forty two years old, Will. I don't understand what they do, bro. I, I don't have a great understanding of it, but the <laughs> that's it's. Uh, it's a new generation, man. They they you know, and they kind of they're good for them. They got. Uh, you know, a big following, and uh, they take advantage of it, and and you know they're they're doing well. But uh, I don't I don't understand it very very well either. But uh, so it's you know when we I mean we don't do as a whole family we'll we kind of lay low. We usually spend 
you know, a lot of like holidays and stuff, we usually just hang out at the house. If we go out in public, it's, I mean, we get mobbed by 16 year old girls. So what has your you brother's know? fame taught you about fame? Uh, it's a, it's a different kind of fame where they're at, man. I'm telling you, cause it's, it's, uh, you know they they are very recognizable, which is kind of normal. But it's this it's this younger generation of kids that I I just I can't I don't understand it. You know I I have a certain it's it's a different deal because you know when people recognize me if if I'm you know eating with my wife or, or doing something they have you know a certain respect for me or whatever and they'll you know kind of wait or shake my hand whatever. Some some of them you know ask for pictures, but most of them will just you know kind of talk with me real quick or whatever these these girls with nash and hayes will just come up and take selfies wherever whenever uh they don't get a break if they're in public it's a whole nother deal so uh it's a little different you mentioned your wife uh, what's the balance for you of ball husband father you have a young daughter H- how do you balance all that as a college kid yeah it's uh you know, it's it's like anything else, man. It's just about creating a routine and, and getting in, you know, good daily habits. It's obviously and and finding a balance. You know, that's kind of what uh, I've had to do through with all this is just try to find a balance. You know, and and uh, you know, give give enough time to my family and to the to the football program and the school and and try and you know maximize each of these things and and balance them all out to where I can, uh, you know, be successful in, in all aspects. So, uh, you know, it definitely took some time. I'm, I've, it's not perfect. It never will be, but, you know, trying to find that the best balance I can is kind of the recipe for it. Nothing changed me like fatherhood. And I think if that's not <laughs> universal, it's pretty close for dudes. Oh, it's, uh, right? uh, yeah. How did it change what, you? What, 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 how has fatherhood impacted your worldview? it's it changes really everything man just your your perspective on in life um you know it it, it, you know for me personally with with what i do um it it kind of you know having somebody having a family to provide for uh is just another kind of motivator uh you know i love the game of football and always have um you know this adds a little motivation for me to you know as far as as far as uh providing goes i mean it it's it's a uh it's it's more motivation to you know succeed on the field uh it also is more you know i'm more focused i don't uh it's really family time and and, and this is i i treat this like a job uh, as far as school and football goes um and that's that's about it man i i play a little golf <laughs> And, uh, you know, spend time with family. I, I don't have a whole lot of time for anything else, and i am never been happier, man. You know, it's just, uh, it's just uh, it's, it was a, kind of a, a life changer, but it was good in all aspects and, uh, you know, really just enjoying where I'm at right now. You discuss having a family to provide for now. So what consideration did you give to entering the 2018 NFL draft? Well, quite a bit. Um, just – having them to provide for obviously i'm uh, uh, <laughs> being in college it's not you don't have you're not rolling in money um i don't know a whole <laughs> lot of people that are something like that but, bro uh, yeah but uh so that that obviously had a little something to do with it last year when i was you know thinking about it but uh you know it kind of just got outweighed by the fact that i'd i'd be back with uh you know the same coaching staff who i'm really close with and i think does a great job i mean it's the first time i'll be playing for uh in the same type style offense for for two years uh since i've been to college uh, i got a lot of good uh teammates back some experienced guys uh you know i think we got a chance to be pretty good this year uh last year would have been a little rushed uh obviously with the injury and everything you know i'd uh, to my throwing hand and getting surgery and all that. I mean, it was just I had a lot going on, and uh, you know, I think uh, you know, even even though it's it's uh, not ideal for Jeannie and the baby to be living here on such a tight budget, I mean, we can squeeze one more year uh, out of it for the you know all the benefits of playing for this great university one more time. So uh, we decided we can make it work, and uh, you know, really looking forward to it, man. Huge for Coach Holgerson and his staff that you're coming back. Who advised you the most and best in that decision? I was, you know, collectively, uh, it was kind of a group uh, effort. Uh, I have my small circle of people that I trust that, that has kind of 
help guide me through this whole thing. And, and I'm really close with Dana and with uh, Spav. Uh, they're, I mean, just spending so much time with them. They're great guys, and we've just become really close. And, uh, you know, they, we, we, we've been on the same page, and they kind of helped guide me through what the, you know, what this upcoming year would look like and, and what they, uh, you know, how they how well they think we could do and how much I could learn. And, um, you know, it just like I said, just collectively with my, you know, small circle and, uh, you know, with obviously with Jeannie, um, we kind of decided that it was it was best for, for everybody for me to come back and uh, do one more year. What do you expect it'll look like? What does 2018 look like for you? Well, I think, you know – Every year, um, everyone has high expectations. That's just how this game is. I mean, everywhere I've been, uh, and you talk to anyone across the country, they're going to tell you that they want to go undefeated and win a national championship and do this and do that. And I think that's normal. I think it, if you didn't have those aspirations, you'd be doing it wrong. So I, I see the same you know, type of goals uh, here. We, we obviously have very high expectations, but I think that uh, – you know, really what we expect is to, you know, just try and build off of what we did last year uh, as a whole team. I think we there's a lot of ways we can improve. Um, and our mindset is just going one to know, you know, and let, let, letting everything else take care of itself. So um, I think that obviously with the high expectations that everybody has, uh, you're just – everyone's competing. That's why it's such a competitive league and, and a competitive game. Just go one to know. If ever yep. there was the son of a coach sentence, that is the son of a coach sentence. That's How, the goal, man. That's I understand, and that's the right perspective. What I wonder is, what's it like playing for your old man? For those of you guys who don't know that are listening, uh, Will played for his father in high school, and they were unbelievably successful, uh, record-setting success. So how's that impact the father-son dynamic when, when he's coaching you? It was funny because you know now we're we're really close. Uh, back then it was it was just I mean when your dad's your coach, he was obviously really really uh, you know hard on me. And there's days where I just was wanted to get away from him because I'd seen so much of him uh, and heard so much of him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but no, I mean it was he's he's obviously a good coach. He's proven that through you know what he's done. He loves to do it. Uh, you know while I was going through it, I it was just you know another one of those things. You know he's my dad and. Uh, I trusted him, and we obviously had some success. Uh, I think he's got a good idea of, uh, you know, coaching offense, and and you know he does a good job in the passing game. And uh, we got some, we had some good players while I was playing there, and uh, you know, kind of made it work. And uh, he's continued to do that, you know, with uh, you know, Sam Hartman that had, had a great career with with Chad. You know, he's mm-hmm. uh, he's got a good uh, he's got a good feel for the game. Um, so you know, like I said, now it's. I mean, we go back and forth on phone calls. We we talk all the time. I help him with, uh, you know, stuff I've learned playing for three different, uh, you know, college staffs. Uh, he's continued to kind of grow his, you know, playbook a little bit based off that, and we just kind of bounce stuff back and forth off each other. And he's helped me a lot through this whole uh, NFL process, just with, uh, just with everything, you know, decision last year, and just you know, he's he's become a good good source for me, a reliable, you know, credible source, uh, just to bounce ideas off of and stuff. Obviously, when you're the quarterback at West Virginia, you're one of the most important, recognizable, revered figures in that entire state. There is no pro ball. There's mm-hmm. the Mountaineers. What's that like? Uh, I mean, there's, there's I, I say this all the time, and this this fan base is is one of a kind. They're just so passionate and prideful about this state and this university. Like you said, there's no pro team, so it's you know it's us, and they love them some Mountaineers, and uh, you know it's a it's a great feeling to you know represent you know the the fine WV. Um, you know the, these guys, they they love it. They eat it up, man. I love playing for them and you know getting to do stuff like fan day or uh seeing people just out in the community and stuff and uh they eat it up so it's it's a lot of fun you noted a moment ago playing for three different college staffs and part of your journey to getting to west virginia and all of those things is what went down in florida what did you learn about yourself during that suspension from florida (laughs) a whole lot uh I had a whole lot of things to fix, a whole lot of things 
to improve on in, in the game of football, but also just in life. I think that's part of college is just kind of finding yourself. Um, I had a whole lot to improve on to, uh, you know, refocus, really find out, you know, who I want to be, who I am, uh, where I want to be. Um, you know, it, it just all kind of, you know, formed the, the man I am today, uh, just through all that experience and, and everything that, that kind of happened, you know, it was just a, uh, um, I think it, it all happened for a reason. Um, and it, like I said, it kind of shaped who I was, who I am now. Uh, it's very different from who I was uh, my first couple of years down in uh, down in Gainesville. What did you have to fix? What changed? Uh, I, I think football-wise, a lot did. I just uh, My mindset, the way I look at it, the way uh, I take care of my body now, the, the things I find important in the game as far as mentally, you know, I was just – it was just pure athleticism and, you know, not a whole lot of work while I was at Florida. You know, I didn't I didn't really understand the game like I do now. I just was, you know, doing what I was told, uh, you know, just kind of winging it, you know, whereas now I understand the game as a whole and I'm, I'm still learning. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of room to grow and in, in, in just my knowledge of the game, but that was the biggest thing. Um football wise and and in life off the field i mean there's countless things that just you know as as you go through college is uh you know you you just kind of find who you are and, and you know your your true self kind of comes out and uh you go through experiences that, that shape you know who you are um and that i i kind of went through that in Gainesville um and then obviously after i got suspended just you know re re gathering myself and deciding what i wanted to do and uh, if football was even in my future and all that, and, and obviously it, it was very much is, is. Um, but it, I mean, it, it's just one of those things, man, you know, that uh, Gainesville wasn't meant to be. So, uh, I found a new home in Morgantown. How much consideration did you give to not playing any longer? Um, no, I just, I, not a whole lot, man. I, I, I love football. Uh, so I knew it, that, you know, deep down, regardless that it, it was going to be a part of my life, just just because of my pure love for the game, uh, I was just in a, a spot where um, I didn't really know what was what was going to happen. I didn't know, you know, how I, I, I was going to respond. Um, you know, I kind of felt ostracized from the team because uh, I wasn't. I didn't transferring was never in my plans. I mean, I loved the University of Florida. I wanted to play there. Um, so for a while, I just didn't understand, you know, was if I was ever going to be back on that team again or how transferring worked or anything like that. Um, so, and you know, after I kind of got a feel for how transferring works and, you know, I, I knew that that was the route to take. A couple more things and we'll get off of that. I just uh... – I wonder what the lasting impact is of that year off. Basically, how does sitting out or being forced to sit out impact your respect for the opportunity to play the game? Uh, a, a lot. I mean, it gave me a whole new appreciation for, you know, for football and what, you know, I, I ran scout team just to, you know, play and, and help guys out. I mean, it gives you a whole, you know, yeah, like I said, and this is I love this game, um, and you really learn how much you love it when you got to sit and watch uh, your whole team. You know, because I invest in whatever team I'm on, man. I came here and you know really started to love the staff and love these guys, and then I had to sit a whole year, couldn't do anything, couldn't help the team. All I could do is run scout team. Um, so it gave me a whole nother level of appreciation when it came uh, time next year to. Um, you know, when I when I finally got to play, I mean, I was just I, I was a kid in the candy store. I was gonna say uh, once the season rolled around. What was that moment like when you're back out there behind center? All right, you're in Morgantown, <laughs> West Virginia. You've been waiting a long time, yeah. and you're out there and you're behind center again. I want you to put me there, bro. What was that moment like for you? Uh, I mean, it was kind of a calm, just happy feeling. Uh, it felt familiar. Uh, it felt like I was, you know, just finally where I needed to be. Um, it wasn't anything like ecstatic or, you know, it's just, I, I mean, I'm a pretty calm, cool guy. You know, I, it just, it was just a calm, uh, you know, happiness. Just, I felt, felt right. Felt like, you know, that's, that's what I had been waiting for. You know, that's what I worked for. 
all this stuff kind of led me to here, and I was just ready for it. I was prepared, and I was, you know, ready to go. Why was West Virginia the right place? A lot of reasons. Uh, you know, I I think Dana is one of the, the best guy, best coaches in the country. Uh, he's an awesome offensive guy. I love hearing him and Spav uh, just talk about offense and and their their uh, their perspective on the game and on offense. It's awesome. Uh, and something I wanted to be a part of coming from the offenses I played in at Florida. I mean, this is a whole lot of fun, man. They give me a lot of freedom. Um, and I've learned a lot about the game uh, with the freedom they give me and with the, what I have to do. I mean, I, I know a lot more about the game as a, as a whole uh, with these guys. Um, and this is obviously just a great place to play, man. These these fans are, are like I said, they're one of a kind. They're They're very passionate and prideful. It's a lot of fun playing for these guys uh and it's a great university um you know it's just a, it's another you know great place to play college football man there's college football is unique and it's a lot of fun uh and places like this are are, are just you know you don't always not everybody gets to play at a place like west virginia so uh it's 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 a, it was kind of a perfect perfect spot for me so we have a substantial contrast in hair between <laughs> you and coach holgerson all right I mean a substantial contrast. Oh, yeah. What do, what discussions arise about the gets, uh, about the locks in the West Virginia locker room? He gets all kind. Of, I love Dana's hair because he owns it, <laughs> and he will. I mean, he'll show up, and it'll be everywhere. And you should see him when he gets on the whiteboard. He gets to thinking, and he starts scratching it, and it gets everywhere. I mean, you've probably seen pictures of him during game day and stuff. I mean, it gets it gets wild, and he just owns it, and I love every bit of it. So you're a dual threat guy, really good passer, really good runner, mobile, the whole thing. What do you think the impact of Deshaun Watson's rookie season before he got injured and, and Baker Mayfield going number one this year, what impact does that have on your draft opportunity and the way teams might view you? Yeah, I think it uh, – I mean, I, I'm I'm pretty similar to Deshaun. I grew up playing with him. We were at the Elite 11 together and stuff. I think he's an awesome kid, man. He's he's one of the my favorite people I've ever met. Um, but I, I mean, I think that the game continues to evolve, uh, in different ways. And, you know, I think when it comes down to it, it, it the, the qualities in the quarterback are, have, have always kind of been the same. You know, you want, you, you gotta be a leader, uh, you gotta be confident and you gotta be able to win games and make everybody else around you better. Um, if you can do that, uh, these, these other traits are just bonuses. You know, I think that you know, Baker's a good player. He, he won games. He 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 obviously uh, won the Heisman. Had all kind of crazy stats and stuff like that. But he uh, he he won, man. He took the he took that team and and led them. And uh, his his energy was contagious. And you know, ended up going first overall. So I think uh, a lot of it speaks to those guys' ability to lead. Um, they're obviously just good athletes uh, as well. You know, they can do some stuff on. Uh, on they can obviously manage the pocket really well and and have great arms, but I think it's the intangibles that um, that they're able to to you know infect the rest of the team. Um, I think that's kind of what makes those guys great. I mean, I love to hear your commentary on Deshaun. Uh, I covered him a lot, man. I'm at Clemson a lot, mm-hmm. and very rarely in this life do you meet someone with that kind of grace. Yeah. He just has this very unique personality about him. I've always been uh, such a huge fan from the day I met him. I think he's a wonderful person, and forget the football player. I just think he's a yeah. tremendous person. He is, man. Uh, he's his he's he's one of my favorites. I'm telling you, man. He's he's awesome. Last thing, how much do you care about the Heisman? Oh man, I, it, it'd be great. I think it'd be great for the university and for uh, you know, obviously a lot of people in this building. But uh, I'm, that that'll take care of itself, man. I care about being one to know every week. <laughs> Coach's son telling you man one and every week <laughs> that's, I wish that's, you, the, that's the goal man I, I wish you the absolute best and i can't tell you how much i appreciate your time i can't wait to get up there to see you and uh man go slaying go spin that thing boss have an yeah, amazing no doubt, summer and an amazing season and uh lead them me lead them mountaineers bubba all right man i uh, appreciate you having me on man thank you that young man stands to have a tremendous senior season at West Virginia University this year. I love his perspective uh, for someone who's 23 years old 
you know, already a father and a husband. And I love to hear him talk about how his teammates want to go out and have fun and kick it. And he's like, nah, man, I'm hanging with my family. And, you know, he's taken quite a road to his current situation. And that offers tremendous perspective that I think will benefit him quite a bit as he makes his way through this through this season and on towards the NFL draft next April. I love what he said about Deshaun Watson. Uh, you heard what I said about Deshaun Watson. I just think that Deshaun has such grace as a person, and I've admired him for some time. Uh, I've admired him, in fact, since I met him. Uh, his story is, is pretty well known, and we'll get into that uh, hopefully someday on this podcast. Maybe I can have Deshaun on. I would love that. I just appreciate him so much, and, and, and thanks so much to Will for sharing his life with us. Uh, you know, he does play at West Virginia, and I grew up eight miles from West Virginia, so that's my people up there. Uh, and they've been known to do some really crazy redneck things out there in the Mountaineer State. That leads us right into the Hillbilly Hotline. Words, sayings, or just a way of life? Roman candles? That's a redneck mortar launcher. That's what that is. <laughs> this is Hillbillyisms. All right, Marty, coming at you with another question once again. As Uh-oh. summertime is starting to hit its, you know, we're, we're getting in the stride of summertime, temperatures up over 85, 90 degrees here in the Carolinas. There is one thing that comes with these hot temperatures especially here in North Carolina, but I'm pretty sure this is a, a southern thing. At what good. point are the short jorts way too short? What I'm speaking about is men, man folk, oh. wearing jorts. I have no problem with jorts. I used to wear jorts. <laughs> I don't wear them no more, God bless. But I know a lot of my fellow southern men who like to wear these jorts, and they like to wear yes, them cut short. Not just yes, above sir. the knee, but I'm talking like, I mean, up halfway scene. up the thigh, these jorts are yes, cut sir. short. They're almost like male Daisy Dukes. I understand <laughs> that we southern men need a little bit of air. It's a little bit hot out. Maybe they're trying to work on their tan. Maybe they're just trying to stay cool while trying to stay looking classy as we can in our redneck way. But, Marty, in your humble opinion, how short is too short? for these short jorts on men down here in the South. My personal opinion, got to be at least to the tip of the kneecap, bro, at least to the top of the kneecap. I don't want to see no man thigh with no hair on the back and freckles on the front. It, it just it ain't doing nothing for me. It turns me off and turns me away from about everything except from the buffet line because, I mean, I can make a sacrifice. But, Marty, what is your <laughs> humble opinion, son? How short is too short on these short jorts on our fellow Southern men. God bless you, brother. Thank you. That is a very fair question that deserves to be addressed. Uh, I've seen a lot of jorts in my day, having grown up in the middle of nowhere, Virginia, again, eight or ten miles from the West Virginia line. Uh, And... I would say that maybe not all the way to the tip of the knee, but you have to go south of the thigh because we can't have any wardrobe malfunctions with jorts. Now, I've seen some dudes who cut them so short that the pockets are hanging out the bottom of the jorts. That is a travesty. You're you're one cannot, you're one bend over from massive air. Yes, that's absolutely right. There's a difference between jean shorts and jorts. Oh, yes. Jorts There's a are homemade. Difference. Jean shorts. Jean shorts, you buy down there to goodies, and they have a, like a hemmed knee, and they're well-tailored. Maybe they're not well-tailored, but they're tailored. They're hemmed up. Jorts, you just bust out mama's orange handle scissors, and you just start hacking. It's it's when you're it's when you're tough skins when you're a little kid, you outgrow them and they become high waters, and eventually they become capris. And then mama goes, all right, it's time to cut those into jorts. Well, the thing is, some of y'all never grew up and continue to cut them into jorts. And it's funny that we're having this conversation on the Will Greer 
edition of Marty Smith's America podcast because Will played his first year at the University of Florida, which is the capital of jorts. So, look, in my humble opinion, I think that you have to put on the jeans and you have to bust out the Sharpie and you have to be very precise about the exact area that you cut the jort. Because, again, let me repeat, you're one dropped set of keys away from falling out of them things. Like, if you're worried about picking up a beer out of a cooler, then the shorts are too short. That's right. I mean, if you, you know, look, man, if you are, if you're at the, if you're at the tailgate and you have a big old Yeti sitting there and they can't, they can't fit it on the actual tailgate and it's on the ground and you got to bend over and you got to get your red label Budweiser out of the cooler. You don't want to scare anybody with, uh, with all your goodies. Do you own a pair? I do not own a pair. I do not. That might be the, that. Do you own a pair? I don't. I, but I, I think our listeners are going to be shocked, Marty, that you don't own a pair. I, I actually thought you might be rocking them on the beach there on this weekend. As much as I, as much as I would, uh, like to be rocking my jorts on the beach here, uh, in South Jersey. No, uh, look, man, I have the palest legs ever created by the good Lord above. Who would be more embarrassed? So, the kids or Laney? Oh, Laney. Yeah, my kids would think it was awesome. They would actually probably want some. But nope, uh, I try to go with the longest, like, billabong board shorts that I can find to cover up as much as possible. And plus, that also has its SPF benefits, Travis. When you are as pale as I am, you bathe in SPF 70. The zinc kind. I'm not talking about, like, the no-ad pink bottle make it you know, make-believe sunscreen. I'm talking about the kind that you spin real paper on with the zinc in it that turns everything stark white and you look like a total tourist. I don't care, man. I'm not here to impress you, son. I'm here to ward off melanoma. And we need to remind people, what number do they call, Marty? Uh, They call 860-315-1615. Oh, nope. <laughs> 860-516-1315. 860-516-1315. that. Eight six zero five one six thirteen fifteen. Y'all call us seriously. You need to call us and tell us your redneck stories, thoughts, perspectives, dreams, hopes, inventions. You tell us, man. If it's redneck, tell. I mean, call us about your favorite pair of jorts. And we're getting tell your college football season. Have. Give us your tailgating stories. Yeah, send. Call us with some tailgating stories. I'm sure you guys have. Uh, I mean, concerts. Lord Almighty. Every day I wake up, I have texts from my buddies about whatever show they were at and how many beers they drank, how hammered they got, and how loud they sang, and off-key for that matter. You ever get, Travis, you ever get videos from your buddies and they're singing? Oh, those are the best. Because you 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 think that you're crushing it, absolutely nailing the lyrics, and you're not. Nailing the lyrics and, like, the pitch and the tone and all of those things, you think because you have the music so loud that you are singing well. You're not. With the little air You're guitar not. thrown into it? Oh, for sure. And the drunker I get, the harder I play the air guitar. All right, I'm going to make a, an awkward segue here. Uh, we have, I, I want to tell you guys an awesome story. It's time for the Marty Party. What are we going to do, bud? We're going to drink one of these beers. Hand me one of them damn beers real quick. I got it. What's up, man? Party party. So last week I was in Seattle, Washington for the Special Olympics USA Games. Any of you guys who listen to the podcast regularly, first of all, thank you. Without you, there's no reason to do it. But I told a story last week about Seth Hanchi, who is a power lifter out of Louisiana, a Special Olympics power lifter who... If you didn't hear last week's show, please go back and listen to it. First of all, it was awesome to have Scott Van Pelt on. I've gotten tremendous feedback about that. And on that note, quickly, I want to hear your feedback. I want to know what you guys think. Uh, it helps us tailor this thing well. So hit us up. Uh, hit me up on Twitter, at Marty Smith ESPN. Uh, go subscribe to the podcast and rate it and review it. On iTunes, write us a review on the, on the review page. Cause we look at it. Trust me. We look at it. So for those of you who did listen last week, you heard me discuss Seth Hanchi. I want to tell you another story 
from the Special Olympics that that sums up that event and its impact and its spirit perfectly. Before we ever got to Seattle, ESPN produced a first-person piece with a runner out of Indiana. And that young man, his name is Andrew Peterson. Andrew was born with fetal alcohol syndrome. And doctors felt like he may never walk, much less run. And now he runs 75 miles a week. That's 4,000 miles a year. It is his voice. It is his passion. And in fact, he just ran a two-hour, 57-minute Indianapolis Marathon, which qualifies him for the 2019 Boston Marathon which he will run in April. So obviously, going into the games, Andrew is a favorite to win the 5K. He's a favorite to win the 5,000 meters, which was run at the track stadium at the University of Washington. They got one of those purple tracks. Really, really pretty facility. Well, I walk in that morning, and I have a buddy named Aaron Mills who runs the Special Olympics group for Michigan. I met Aaron in Austria in 2017 when one of his runners, I was captivated by one of his runners, and I did a story with him, and Aaron and I became close. I walk into the track stadium at Washington, and Aaron walks over to me, and he says, see that guy? And he points at a young man, lot like very tall, he's probably 6'3", super lean, just screams, I'm a runner. His name is Julian Borst. He goes, he's going to win this race. And I was like, man, I don't know. Andrew Peterson, he goes, I know about Andrew. Andrew's story is phenomenal. Julian just ran an hour 15 half marathon. Now, I'm a runner, guys. I run a lot, almost every single day. Uh, I've run the Boston Marathon myself. So to run a 115 half marathon, you're talking about legit speed. So I'm like, all right, I'll watch him. Well, the race starts, and early in the race, Andrew Julian gets out early, and Andrew is right behind him, almost drafting him like race cars do. And as the race progressed and got towards halfway, Julian started to pull away. And as we got to nine laps of the 12 and a half laps that made up the race, he was gone. Ultimately, Julian lapped the field. And it was a phenomenal performance, unlike many I've seen. He ran a 16.26 5K. I want you to do that math. He ran a 16.26 5K. He wins the gold medal in the 5,000 meters. Andrew came in second and was very, very fast himself, faster than most people I run with for sure. Well, after the race, I wanted to interview Andrew about his performance, and I wanted to interview Julian as well. So I interviewed Andrew individually, and I wanted to make Julian comfortable. And I could see that he and Andrew had a great rapport with one another. They sat together after the race and discussed their race, poured water on their heads. It was a hot, humid morning. And I bring Julian in to interview him alongside Andrew and as I was discussing with Julian the fact that he once uh, was going to run a 5k and he couldn't get a ride to the race so he just ran to the race that's the kind of guy he is he's just like all right if I can't get there I'm gonna run there he's in the middle of a sentence and Andrew goes "Oh, oh, oh hold on hold on hold on hold on I forgot something Andrew's bib number was one So he had a one on his chest. He also had a one, a numeral one sticker on his shorts, on his thigh. And as Julian is talking, Andrew peels the one off of his shorts and he plants it right on Julian's chest. And he said, you earned number one. And it was one of the most amazing moments I've ever seen in sport. It was the spirit of competition and the spirit of the brotherhood that is built between the lines. 
you just kicked my tail. And I respect you so much for that. So you take this one. I, I'll never forget it. It was beautiful is what it was. It was absolutely beautiful. And I will take it with me for all my days. Thank you guys so much for taking the time to listen to this podcast every week. I want you to know, I want you to know how fulfilled I feel that you guys are enjoying it. I want you to know how fulfilled I feel that what Travis and I, this is a passion project for Travis and me. We decided we wanted to interview people that we find to be interesting and captivating and have a story that's going to impact the world. And to see the momentum that we're building and to see that you guys are starting to make this thing appointment listening is so fulfilling for us. We don't do it for us, but we sure do feel good about it. And so thank you guys for being passionate about it and caring enough to give us your hour every week. Thank you to Travis for always getting these amazing guests. And thank you to Louise for being crazy enough to give us this platform. And again, above all, it's about you guys. Thank you for listening. And God bless America. We're so blessed to live in the greatest country on this earth. Have a great week. 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 Have a great week.